Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Mary Field and Vincent D. P. Gabo Lecture on Women's Contributions to Church and Society. Tonight, we welcome Elizabeth, or better known as Betty Ann Donnelly, the co-founder and preacher coordinator for Catholic Women Preach. Many of our past STM speakers, faculty, and alumni have been featured on the Catholic Women Preach website. Ms. Donnelly received her Bachelor's of Science in Foreign Service from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service and a Master in Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School. She also did doctoral studies in Harvard's Department of Government, regularly teaching Harvard undergrads. Ms. Donnelly is a member of a group of female foundation leaders who have engaged in dialogue with top Vatican officials on the role of women in the church and is a frequent speaker and writer on Catholic affairs. Along with Russ Petrus, Ms. Donnelly is co-editor of the first two volumes of Catholic Women Preach for cycle A and B. Copies of the latter will be available for sale following the presentation. So please help me to welcome her. Warm thanks, Sister Jen, for that generous introduction. And warm thanks to you all for the invitation to speak at such a distinguished, visionary, and love-generating Catholic Student Center. You were blessed to be part of this community. I have spent many happy times here over the years with my dear friend, Carrie Robinson, and I can feel Bob Beloyne's welcoming presence and see the twinkle in his eye that he would regularly send my way during treasured gatherings here. In my remarks, I'd like to briefly address three points. First, the origins of the Catholic Women Preach website. Second, how it works. And third, where things stand for Catholic women's ability to preach, given the historic month-long synod meeting in Rome that concluded on October 29th. To begin, I grew up in Pittsburgh, literally in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. He lived two blocks away from us. He was a wonderful man. And I was educated by the marvelous Sisters of Mercy. I have always attributed my passion for Catholic social thought as having been first engendered by the beloved and demanding Sister Mary Peter, who in our eighth grade civics class taught us the social encyclicals such as Pacham and Terras, Peace on Earth. I was from then on hooked and inspired. After studying international political economy and ethics at Georgetown and serving on the staff of Bread for the World, the ecumenical anti-hunger advocacy group, and the Presidential Commission on World Hunger under Jimmy Carter, I discerned that I wanted to serve as a Mary Nole missioner and accepted a position in Lima, Peru. It was an incredibly eye-opening experience. During my fall 1980 orientation semester at Mary Knoll's headquarters in Austin, New York, I had a very moving encounter with Jean Donovan five weeks before she and her three companions were murdered in El Salvador. Then in Lima, I encountered the extreme poverty of my neighbors in the Ciudad de Dios shantytown. Poverty exacerbated by the international debt crisis in which so many low-income countries were slashing their education, social service, and healthcare budgets in order to just pay the interest they owed on their external debts. Returning to the US, I determined to continue my academic work in theology, political economy, and international ethics. My principal teacher and mentor was Father Brian Hare, a longtime advisor to the US bishops on international policy issues. I never did finish my doctoral dissertation, but I researched, wrote, and spoke extensively on the ethics of the debt crisis, its profound impact on the poor, and the role the Catholic Church played worldwide in the broad coalition of groups addressing the crisis from the 1970s through the new millennium. Does anyone remember the Jubilee campaign? Do you remember seeing Bono from U2 famously giving a pair of his shades to Pope John Paul II? We use the concept of a jubilee year of debt forgiveness in the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus to advocate for debt relief as a worthy way of celebrating the new millennium. 
When you think about it, when our church addresses an ethical policy issue as the world's largest international organization, it is blessed to do so through a wide network of institutions, Catholic universities, schools, hospitals, social service organizations, bishops' conferences, dioceses, parishes, embassies, research and policy institutes, religious and lay missionary orders, etc. In my research on the low-income country debt issue, I interviewed many of the top policymakers involved, including the leaders of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and key members of Congress like Senator Bill Bradley of New Jersey, who is an incredibly great and visionary leader. I would ask these people about their views of the Catholic Church's efforts on the debt crisis. The overwhelming majority said that they most intensely admired the Catholic Church because it was women religious, lay people, priests and brothers who were accompanying the very poorest of the poor around the world. But they disagreed with the church's position on several other issues, which they thought undermined the church's credibility, including its failure to incorporate women in leadership. This experience contributed to and deepened my own growing conviction that we in the church have a fabulous treasure in Catholic social thought that can help Catholics and non-Catholics alike think about our obligations to one another, especially to our sisters and brothers most on society's margins, and to our planet. Concepts such as the inherent dignity of the human person, work for the common good, the universal destination of the goods of creation, solidarity, and the preferential option for the poor and marginalized, and care for creation through integral ecology. And yet one of the key reasons people, and especially young people, are not interested in engaging this very rich tradition is the church's position on several issues, not the least of which is its failure to fully engage women in the church's leadership and treat women as equally made in the image and likeness of God able to model Jesus' love and servant leadership. Our family has a small family foundation based in Pittsburgh, and since the early 1980s, we have been a member of FADICA, F-A-D-I-C-A, which stands for Foundations and Donors Interested in Catholic Activities. FADIGA is an amazing consortium of approximately 55 foundations with a wide range in asset size. Members range from tiny little family foundations like ours to major donors, such as Conrad Hilton, he loved women religious, Raskob, and the Casson Foundation. The latter provided much of the initial funding for the network of inner city Cristo Rey schools you may know of. I began attending Fatiga meetings after my return from Peru in 1983, and over the years, many of those colleagues have become like family, with a culture of quietly generous, humble, and thoughtful giving, accompanying partner agencies and ministries here in the US around the world. Beginning in 2007, Several of us women in Fatiga were invited by a European colleague with close ties at the Vatican to meet there with cardinals and other leaders of key offices to discuss concrete ways in which to promote women in the church's leadership. Acutely aware of the unusual access we were being granted, we consulted widely among theologians and other church leaders to help us choose which issue, issues to raise and how to frame them. We had candid conversations, and I think they were genuinely surprised by our level of preparation, and we were invited back for many additional meetings. If you are interested, my beloved friend and companion in crime, Carrie Robinson of STM, wrote a superb October 2013 article in America Magazine about our efforts, the article was originally titled, Opening Doors, Women in Dialogue at the Vatican. You can access it online under this title that you see on the screen. Even though Carrie's article is 10 years old, the issues it raises are still incredibly pressing today in terms of keeping young women 
interested in staying Catholic. In our Vatican meetings, the principal issues we raised were, one, integrating more women in senior leader, leadership positions at the Vatican, two, restoring women to the Catholic diaconate, and three, revising the Catholic lectionary, the official set of readings on a three-year basis, to include readings featuring women as protagonists in the Hebrew Bible and New Testament that are currently omitted, made optional as part of longer readings, or relegated to a weekday. And I can say more of that in, if time allows in the Q&A. Carrie and I also served on the Women's Advisory Board at the Woodstock Theological Center at Georgetown University before the center closed. In Advent of 2011, the fellows there, agreeing that women's voices were not being sufficiently heard, decided to film four of us preaching on the readings for the, for the four Sundays of Advent in Copley Crypt Chapel on Georgetown's campus, which is indeed a beautiful space. Woodstock distributed the reflections on Vimeo, and they received very positive feedback from their supporters. One night in, I think, early 2013, I was lying in bed unable to sleep, and it suddenly hit me. Perhaps it was the Holy Spirit at work. We scale it up and create a content-controlled, fully accessible website and feature gifted Catholic women from around the world, diverse in age and ethnicity, reflecting on the upcoming readings for Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. We keep the re reflection short, just five to seven minutes, and we post them on the website at least two weeks in advance. So clergy preparing their homilies and a whole host of others in ministry can use the reflections, for example, for RCIA or religion and theology classroom conversations or small Christian communities. It took me a while to find a partner for the venture, but I discovered that people in the Cleveland-based church reform group Future Church were thinking of a similar project. They were seeking to expand their Unheard Homilies project, introduced in 2001 as part of their annual Mary of Magdala celebration. So we decided to collaborate and launched the website in Advent 2016. My extraordinarily talented colleague, Russ Petrus, Future Church's co-director, designed and manages the website, and I serve as the preacher coordinator. We are incredibly gr grateful to our distinguished advisory board, who from the outset trusted us and have recommended many fabulous women to preach. Those of you taking theology courses may recognize some of these faces. And here is a slide of the Yale-related preachers we have had so far, including the Margaret, marvelous Sister Margaret Farley, who taught at Yale Divinity School. As one of my Fatiga friends said, BA, did you ever think you'd have a job titled preacher coordinator? I look ahead at the readings and invite, invite women from around the world who we think would be particularly interested in and appropriate for those readings. So for example, in 2018, one of the summer readings was the text from the fifth chapter of Mark in which Jesus cures the little girl, saying to her in Aramaic, Talitha kum, little girl, get up. I thought about the extraordinary network the Catholic women religious around the world, organized by UISG, the International Union of Superiors General, have to assist the victims of human trafficking. The name of their network, Talitha Kum. So we invited Italian sister Gabriella Botani, the international coordinator of Talitha Kum, to preach on that reading. Another example from that year. One Sunday, the reading was the account from the seventh chapter of Mark, of Jesus' encounter with the deaf man. Agnes Brazal, a distinguished theologian from the Philippines who had previously preached for us, had recommended one of her doctoral students, Christine Meneses, saying that Christine's specialty was deaf ethics. So we invited Christine to preach on that reading. And she had a very interesting perspective drawn from her conversations with the deaf community that rather than a story of healing, this was about us being called, like Jesus, to be open in Aramaic epatha, to respect and acceptance of the deaf 
in whatever way they express themselves. Needless to say, it has been a fat, fantastically rewarding job and a true pleasure to meet, at least virtually, and lift up the voices and ministries of amazing Catholic women from around the world. We decided these past three Lents and Holy Weeks, the most sacred time of the year, to intentionally center the voices of women of color. And Boston College's School of Theology and Ministry has partnered with us for several years, offering an online Lenten course featuring our preachers. If you hadn't yet done so, I, I encourage you to take a look at the website, listen, and be nourished and challenged. Since we launched the website in Advent 2016, over 430 women have offered inspiring reflections, and all of them remain fully accessible on the website. So say you are teaching a class and want to have your students see a Catholic woman reflecting on Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman. You put the scripture reference, or just Samaritan woman, in the search box, and you get Sister Kathy Hilkert, who teaches at Notre Dame, and I understand has previously uh, spoken at this lecture. Or, another personal favorite, Jesus' encounter with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. You get Sister Anita Baird, founder of the Archdiocese of Chicago's Office on Racial Justice. Anita is simply amazing and I have watched that video at least 15 times. To date, Catholic Women Preach has been visited more than 1.5 million times, and our videos have been viewed over half a million times, engaging viewers in nearly 45,000 hours of seeing and hearing Catholic Women Preach. And we receive feedback every week from Catholics about the, how their entire perspective on things has been changed by this witness. We are in the process of adding a new section to the website, homilies about women omitted from the Catholic lectionary, tentatively titled Hidden Sisters. Sister Carolyn Osick, a retired professor at CTU, got us started September 3rd, two years ago, with a spectacular reflection on St. Phoebe's feast day. As you might know, the only time the word deacon is used in the New Testament associated with someone's name is in Paul's letter to the Roman, chapter 16. Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, deacon of the church at Chencre. Help her out in, in any way you can. She has been so helpful to me. Phoebe is not in the lectionary, you're A, B, or C, because it might confuse the faithful. Also, how many of you know that women in the early church were apostles? Apostles, apostle means one who is sent out. Mary Magdalene's title in the early church was apostle to the apostles. And again, in another passage of Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 16, not in our three-year lectionary cycle, among the many female and male colleagues Paul thanks is Junia the Apostle. Who knew? Another piece of good news is that my dear friend Robert Ellsberg of Marinol's Orbis Books asked to publish a three-volume series of Catholic Women Preach, one book for each year of the lectionary. Quite serendipitously, we launched the website in Year A, and the first volume of Year A homilies was published in October 2022. Sister Barbara Reed, the president of the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, wrote an incredibly powerful foreword for the book on the clear historical record of women preaching. The Year B book is now available for purchase, and Professor Cecilia Gonzalez Andreu of Loyola Marymount contributed a simply stunning foreword. Laura James, a young African-American artist, has contributed amazing cover art. On the left, her Mary Magdalene Proclaims Resurrection graces the Year A book, and on the right, a detail of her Mary Magnificat is stunning on the Year B book cover. A very pregnant Mary is preaching uh, the Magnificat in an urban setting. Our Catholic Church, here comes everybody. Cecilia's foreword is in part a meditation on Lara's prophetic art. Many of us believe that our task is also to change the visual narrative of Christian art with more inclusive and positive images of women. God love Leonardo da Vinci, 
but there is no way only Jesus and 12 men were celebrating a Passover Seder meal alone. How many Catholics are used to boring art in their churches, schools, and hospitals that does not inspire deeper reflection? I, for one, would love to see posters of Laura's art widely distributed. Another favorite is Sister Peggy Baudet's Mary Magdalene Proclaiming the Resurrection. Notice the female as well as male disciples, including Peter's wife. As you know, many Catholics have never seen a woman preach. And in our current liturgical practice, we limit those who can preach during mass to priests and deacons, or to a lay person who might be asked to make remarks perhaps after communion, like here. If we have a Corinthians understanding of the church as the living body of Christ, in which members of the body are given different spiritual gifts to serve and to nourish the whole body, it would seem that we are not fully availing ourselves of the gift of preaching given to lay and vowed women religious and lay men, and we are all unnecessarily impoverished. Let me end on a hopeful note. Despite the slow pace of church renewal amid fraught and challenging times indeed, as many of you know, Pope Francis has committed to a renewal of the Vatican II notion of the church, not as a static hierarchical pyramid, but as the pilgrim people of God on the road together, and synodality as a way of being church, the laity, religious, and clergy alike, equal by virtue of our baptism, deeply listening to one another, dialoguing and discerning together the will of the Holy Spirit as we seek to be more effective and joy-filled missionary disciples on the road together. In October of 2021, Pope Francis inaugurated a three-year global synodal process, again with the clear understanding that synodality, journeying together as the people of God, does not end after three years, but should rather be our way of being church. From October 20, 2021 through mid 2023, in what observers have called the broadest consultation in human history, thousands of remarkable listening sessions were held worldwide by small Christian communities, parishes, dioceses, and other Catholic groups. Did any of you in the room participate in any of the listening sessions? Yay, good, good. Some dioceses did not promote them sufficiently. Key findings were synthesized at the local, regional, national, and continental levels and sent to the Vatican Synod Office. Most of the reports included an urgent call for women's further leadership, authority, and ministry in the church. Then last spring, a small group of theologians and other experts gathered outside of Rome to reflect on all that was gathered and drafted for Pope Francis' approval a working document for the first phase of a synodal assembly in Rome. The first session, which just took place in October, and the second will be next October, 2024. The working document, it's called in Latin, the Instrumentum Laboris, and many of the national and continental reports are available for your viewing on the synod.va website. I am very delighted to report that a key leader of the Synod office, French sister Natalie Beckhart, agreed to preach for Catholic Women Preach in the very midst of this busy process, quite appropriately on the readings for Pentecost. Come Holy Spirit. Just put Sister Natalie's name in the Catholic Women Preach search engine and you can be inspired. Last month, in the first session of the Synodal Assembly, Approximately 450 Catholic leaders gathered in Rome for an historic month-long synodal meeting. For the first time in modern history, lay people and women religious, including some 54 women, were among the participants listening, dialogue, and discerning around round tables and able to vote on the final document. While participants were urged not to speak publicly of individual conversations and interventions, they were able to speak enthusiastically about the process they followed in their conversations, which many feel should be further incorporated throughout the church worldwide. Are any of you familiar with the term conversations in the spirit? Raise of hands. No? 
Uh, it is a method many women's religious communities have long used. Synod participants organized by language groups around round tables began with prayer and asked what name each person would like to be called by. Each participant was given a timed three minutes to respond to the question at hand without interruption. There was then a period of silent prayer and each person shared in turn what they had heard in that first round, what they were moved by, where did they feel the Holy Spirit moving them. Then there was a time for free discussion, questions and challenges. Each table had a secretary who wrote a summary of convergences, divergences, tensions and questions. And a rapporteur would present these for the table in the plenary session. Individuals could make short interventions in the plenary sessions with priority given to those who had not yet spoken. Particip participants reported feeling that the process allowed free and honest expression of a points of agreement and disagreement. I urge you to go to the synod.va website to read the resulting synthesis document for a synodal church in mission. It's 41 pages and is organized around 20 topics discussed and under each are first listed one, convergences, two, matters for consideration and the need to continue to deepen our understanding pastorally, theologically, and canonically, and three, proposals, possible paths forward that were suggested, recommended, and requested. It's my understanding that each paragraph of the synthesis document and the 81 total proposals were voted on by 365 voting participants. And I was happy to hear that all the paragraphs received the necessary two thirds vote to be included. Here are two examples of hope filled, oops, sorry, hope filled language about women's and men's equal baptismal dignity um, and that uh, we have to enhance, recognize and enhance women's contributions in the pastoral responsibility of the church and uh, that perhaps new ministries might be needed and whose responsibility is it to discern and at what level and what ways. N nevertheless, it was discouraging that the two paragraphs on women and the diaconate received the highest number of negative votes. One, the first paragraph was 279 to 67, and the next one was 277 to 69. And the key text in that deliberation is here. Uh, Russ and I put together these slides before we had the official English translation of that final document. And if the end, towards the end of the first paragraph, some express fear that this request is an expression of a dangerous anthropological confusion. <laughs> um, actually, in the, in the official version, it's a worrying uh, anthropological confusion. There is the possibility that some may have voted no here because they favor women's restoration to the diaconate and found the language inadequate. I urge you to read the marvelous books of Phyllis Sagano, one of the world's experts on the history and theology of women in the diaconate. She has noted that the International Theological Commission recommended that women be restored to the diaconate over 20 years ago. It was first recommended favorably at a synod of bishops by Archbishop Paul André de Rocher of Canada at the 2015 Synod on the Family. At the 2019 Synod on the Amazon, a clear majority of Amazonian bishops and other participants called for women's ordination to the diaconate in order to recognize sacramentally what women are already engaged, that women are already engaged in diaconal ministry there. Is this just us kicking the can further down the road? While many of us who have labored so long for the greater inclusion of women and our LGBTQ plus friends in the church, may have been disappointed that the final document did not fully reflect the changes called for from around the world. There is a clear call in the document and from Pope Francis that research, discussion, and dialogue continue. As Deb Rose, Russ's co-director at Future Church noted, there are many proposals in the synthesis that will advance women's roles in ministry in the church as they are developed over the next year leading up to the second synod meeting in Rome. 
Part two, section nine of the synthesis describes the need for inclusive language that more fully lifts up women's faith and includes a richer set of images, words, and narratives that recall women's ministry in the early church. We believe that Catholic women preach and especially our Hidden Sisters project will help illuminate that conversation. Deb also notes another proposal in section nine uses the word urgent to describe the need to open more doors to women's in ministry and authority in decision-making bodies. Part two, section eight speaks of expanding lay pre preaching as part of the ministry of the word. One proposal there states, quote, we need more creativity in establishing ministries according to the needs of local churches with the particular involvement of the young. One can think of further expanding responsibilities assigned to the existing ministry of le lector, responsibilities that are already broader than those performed in the liturgy. This could become a fuller ministry of the word of God, which in appropriate contexts could also include preaching, end quote. A bit unclear as to whether that would include lay preaching during mass, but here and elsewhere, the document refers to the need for more decentralization to meet the needs of the local church. This is hopeful for regions such as the Amazon and Germany, where local bishops are ready to move forward. Many theologians, especially among the Dominican order of preachers who have been so supportive of Catholic Women Preach, have long been working on increasing these opportunities for qualified lay people, especially women, to preach. I realize that this is a very busy time of year for you as the semester draws to a close. Perhaps over the winter break, you may take the time to read through the Instrumentum Laboris and the Synthesis document. You might pray individually or in a group. The Synod participants are urging us to continue the process of listening to each other, discerning together, and acting faithfully as the pilgrim people together most attentive to those who are in any way excluded or on the margins. I hope that you will visit the Catholic Women Preach and Future Church websites to be nourished and challenged on your journey. Also, the fabulous organization Discerning Deacons, co-chaired by my friends and colleagues Ellie Hidalgo and Casey Stanton, have ample resources on their website as well including moving testimonies by their friends engaged in diaconal ministry throughout the world, especially in the Amazon. I urge you, perhaps in the spring, to make an appointment with your local bishop to voice your concerns. It is your church. You are a vital part of the body of Christ, giving witness by your lives to God's radical love, mercy, and desire that everyone be included and flourish especially those of our friends on the margins. Please look to the examples of those who have gone before us in the faith, learn their stories. As my husband, Phil Pulaski, a fellow Mary Knoll lay missioner and recently retired doctor at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless said, the stories of our sisters and brothers on the road together are gifts and we should treat them with reverence. And please purchase copies of the Catholic Woman Preach Year B book. It's the perfect Christmas gift as we're about to enter another Year B book of readings this Advent. Buy a copy for your favorite pastor or bishop. <laughs> Any royalties we will be used to support the website. Heartfelt thanks for having invited me. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing both some of your own personal history with this as well as lifting up some of the women. We all have hopes for the Synod. It's not there yet in terms of what many are hoping for, but um, I'm wondering with the examples of people like Jean Donovan, who certainly preached with her life, some of the artwork that you mentioned, and other places of preaching, where do you think those other places can still be opened up for women until that moment that women are preaching in front of the pulpit regularly? Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, a lot of women that I've met along the journey have found very creative ways of preaching. Um, in um, many parishes, uh, uh, people who are engaged in parish ministry have prayer services, uh, other than the Eucharist, um, where women are fully able to preach. People engaged in uh, hospital chaplaincy work, 
um, uh, often preach. Um, it, it, it is a it is a challenge for women engaged in hospital chaplaincy work because they accompany families to the very last minute, and then a priest has to come in to do the final blessing, which is, which is just uh, why, why. Um, so I, I think there are different venues, um, and a small Christian communities. A lot of, especially in the African church, is organized around small Christian communities, and women freely preach. More questions, please. Okay. Hi, um, thank you so much for this uh, really wonderful talk. Um, so my question is about the Synod. Um, as you sort of said, uh, the Synod is very revolutionary in process, um, and in outcome there is perhaps some disappointment. Mm -hmm. um, so far, particularly from um, women's activists in the church and LGBT activists in the church. Yes. Um, so I guess I wonder, given that we have sort of one more year of the Synod, and we know that all the things we might want changed aren't necessarily even gonna be changed after that year, um, how do we uh, like dispositionally approach the rest of this process? Um, do we continue to sort of, as Pope Francis says, uh, trust the process, the Synod is not a parliament, et cetera, et cetera? Do we imagine something different? How do we approach the next year? Thank you for an excellent question. Um, as you may know, so this synodal process is consultative, not deliberative. So that, so this first round are recommendations, and then we have another year to discern and to really. I mean, I'm just taking it in myself. It's just out new out this week. You know, I've, I really want to sit and pray with it, um, intentionally alone and in groups, to have more conversations. Um, and then the second, it's, it's not clear if the second round will be the same participants. It'll be interesting to see if it'll be the same participants gathered in Rome next year. And then they'll make recommendations and then Pope Francis may issue an exhortation of some sort. Now, in, in the meantime, um, I know there's an initiative. People are, are trying to make fruitful the, 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 I think one of the hopeful things is this call for decentralization. Okay, what, is the, what are the essential elements of our faith that we all have to believe as Catholics? But if there are parts of the church who, who for example, are willing to move forward on women restored to the diaconate, women were deacons for the first, half, first century, of the church, first millennium of the church, Phyllis knows. Um, if some dioceses and regions like the Amazon are ready to move forward with that, what's the problem? So I think that part of it is to um, try to push for decentralization and to, like I said, to meet with your local bishops um, and people in the bishops conference and to say that this is a clear directive that we want to see. And um, I think they know that people are walking away. People are walking away. Um, but the process is very, very powerful and has broken down some resistance and some barriers. And yet, um, as we know, there was, there was a big pushback in the global south from some of the participants on the idea of even uh, same-sex blessing ceremonies. So um, I think just creativity has to occur at the local level. Um, and, uh, and support those like Sister Natalie who are so deeply committed to the process. I don't know if it's a satisfying answer, but. So one thing that concerns me when people talk about sort of big changes in, mm -hmm. in church teaching, whether it be, you know, to holy orders mm -hmm. or whether it be the church's sexual teachings, mm -hmm. um, is that so much of the talk in support of these things gets couched in sort of sociological and political language, mm -hmm. like how will this impact what people think of the church? How will this impact the church's numbers? Um, or political language, like, oh, well, if you don't like something about the church's teaching, yeah. you know, go and call up your local bishop, kind of, you know, um, this this kind of, which seems like a a, a departure from sort of one of the traditional ways in which in which the church's social teaching goes along, which is in the realm of ontology, metaphysics, the study of being, 
Um, and so this, I don't know, this, this sort of worries me. So, and as we think about sort of discerning what the Spirit has, you know, mm -hmm. in store for the church in, in bringing the gospel into this, this new mm -hmm. um, millennium, um, how do we make sure that what we're, what we're listening to is the spirit of truth and rather than sort of the spirit of the age? Great question. Wonderful question. Thank you. Um, I think uh, it requires a multidisciplinary um, engagement of theology with the social sciences, with psychology, with what we know and how our understanding, for example, of human sexuality has changed. And with the understanding that we, again, to focus what is the central message of the good news of Jesus of Nazareth, uh, the risen Christ, and what can change. So for example, doctrine has developed. Doctrine has developed. There, there, um, there used to be a prohibition against charging interest on loans, usury. That changed. The church's teaching on slavery changed. Um, a very distinguished uh, jurist, John Noonan, uh, wrote, Kathleen Caveney, I don't know if you know of her work, she, she was a clerk for him, talked about doctrine does develop, and part of it is due to our, as I said, multidisciplinary understanding improves about, um, about um, where we are today in, in various sciences, and also in our research of what was in the early church. As I said, you know, that there's a resistance to women being deacons. Well, women de were deacons for the first millennium of the church. Abbesses were ordained as deacons. Uh, Phyllis, there's, there's, there's records of ordination rights for abbesses in the, uh, in the, in the uh, 11th century. So uh, it's, a, it's a careful retrieval of the tradition, and, but also faithful to, yes, let's discern what is essential to our faith and where the Holy Spirit is calling us to. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I really appreciated, sorry, <clears throat> if recovering from a cold. Um, I really appreciated the way that you talked about the importance of language and omission, um, specifically in uh, liturgy and um, yes. lectionary spaces. And I was curious, I also was drawn to the to the line about sort of the the your translation was dangerous, but the worrisome um, anthropomorphic confusion. And I was thinking about how often um, the response of the tradition to women's spirituality and the expression of that spirituality is to codify it in language that it is dangerous or mm -hmm. worrisome or um, that it mm -hmm. is confusing somehow in a way that um, the spirituality of men is not. Um, and so I'm curious how you exist in the space of a tradition that sort of often views women's spirituality as having this slightly dangerous um, connotation to it, um, or perhaps maybe lean into that um, as sort of a, a force for forward movement. Wonderful question. I think that if you go to the website, you'll see that many of our preachers have engaged this question and how um, in various dimensions, women's spirituality and experience um, is so different. So for example, um, Professor Janine Hill Fletcher from Fordham School uh, Department of Theology, I invited her to do um, Corpus Christi, The Body and Blood. I've never heard a, hom a homily with the use of the word blood so often. <laughs> And um, I encourage you to take a look at that one. And so women's experience of menstrual blood is so very different from a man uh, preaching on that reading. Um, so I, I, I urge you to take a look at the website because a lot of women engage with, with that. We, 
we, uh, I've, there's so many issues in this Sonoto report that I don't have time to cover. But one of them is the formation of seminarians. And uh, many of us have raised the objection, and it was heard in this report, that in some diocesan seminaries around the world, they are eliminating even women professors and spiritual directors. And so th they don't have an experience of having women as fellow students and colleagues, and less and less so they have women as professors. So they come out and, uh, of seminary, and because of the pre-shortage, many of them be instantly become pastors without an experience of women's perspective on theology and spirituality. And that's mentioned in the report. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. What are your future goals for Catholic Women Preach and why? Ooh, that's a good question. God, we're just trudging along. <laughs> I mean, literally, I sit at home in my office and I have to find someone to preach on every Sunday and every holy day of obligation. So it's a constant. Um, we're, like I said, we're hoping to develop the website more fully. We work on a shoestring budget. Uh, marketing money could help. Um, so we spread the word because, like I said, we have this incredible body of really rich preaching. There's 430 homilies you can, ex you can access on this. You know, say you're doing the dishes. You know, just put someone's name in and you can hear her while you're doing the dishes. Um, so I think getting the word out is, is it, and then much more fully developing this part of the, of the website about the hidden sisters, the women who are left out of the lectionary, you know, just completely left out or made optional as part of longer readings. Thank you. Hello, thank you for your lecture. Um, I was interested in the discussion that was happening about women as deacons and um, mm -hmm. that position kind of being renewed as going back to the tradition of the early church. Mm -hmm. um, but I was very uh, surprised when you said that the idea was being put forth that some regions that were ready to move ahead with that could do so um, while others wouldn't and that that would be uh, one way to deal with the fact that not everyone's on the same page about women mm -hmm. as deacons. Um, so my question for you is what you think the possible consequences of that could be. Um, because, you know, from our earliest age, we're taught that, like, Catholic means universal. Uh -huh. um, and I think that especially in this day and age, um, we either stand united or fall divided. And so how do you think that doing a move that drastic, um, although it may, you know, like, personally, I do support women as deacons, but mm -hmm. I don't know what the potential negative consequences could be of doing oh. something and only part of the church like that? I, it's a very good question. I think that um, even though there was such support for it at the 2019 Amazonian Synod, like I said, go to the Discerning Deacons website. Look at the videos of what these women are doing. There's not a priest in 100 or 200 miles. I mean, they're running Eucharistic services. They, they can't bless the bread, but they're doing homilies. They're officiating weddings and funerals. I mean, hello, who else is going to be doing this ministry? So in essence, women are already doing the diaconal ministry in, in some parts of the world. And so what they're asking for is a sacramental recognition of that to the, the grace that comes from the sacrament. Um, I think that Pope Francis at the 2019, he, he, he realized your question. So he wasn't ready to let them go ahead but like I said, the, the reality on the ground is that, well, I don't know if you don't call them deacons, but this is what these women are doing. Um, it's very, very powerful testimony. So again, um, it'll be interesting to see what comes after a year and then it, what he decides to do and how much decentralization will be allowed on which issues. And can we maintain the unified body of Christ if we have some differences in pastoral practice and how much leeway can still hold us together. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello. Hi. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the talk. Great homily. I, oh, <laughs> my little perverino there, doing up for our, our lay chaplain to give yeah. the uh, reflection, which we're very proud to be able to offer that opportunity, and we 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 hope that that's something that uh, you know that, that people appreciate for sure. Um, no, thank you so much. I just I guess one one just maybe it was a small thing, just a kind of a clarification that you had mentioned um, the role of the the, the, the lay chaplains in, in, in healthcare facilities and hospitals that accompany this person to the very last minute, yeah. and then they, they have to call the priest to come in and bless them. Why? Um, as someone who kind of gets those calls, like sometimes in the middle of the night after right. a long like 14, 15 hour day. Yes to shoot down the street to Yale New Haven Hospital to, to give right. that blessing. Um, usually it's, it's at, at the request, the call from spiritual care, the lay chaplain, um, who are grateful that right. they're, they're able to you know, get a priest in there to, to offer right. um, not just the blessing, but, but sacramental absolution, apostolic pardon, um, in order to send that person home straight into the hands of our right. loving God. Um, so uh, oftentimes it comes it's either from the, uh, the, the healthcare staff um, mm -hmm. and, and the chaplains who we do depend on to be uh, like kind of accompany these families and give right. that pastoral care. Um, so we see it um, at least, you know, the lay and, and, and clergy as, as a really um, important collaboration uh, to be able to, you know, accompany these people and then, and then finally to give them, you know, that sacramental grace. Um, right. So just kind of like you had, you had left it with why. Um, so maybe just firsthand experience, that, that's the why. I thoroughly yeah. agree with you and I understand sure. your perspective, but think about parts of the world yeah, where totally. there are no priests. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, so. and that's it, rural parts of the United States. That's the problem, you know, so. Oh, thank you. We continue to discern you know, where the Spirit is leading us in this. Yeah, it's, sure. uh, a lot of people can't pick up the phone, and they don't, they're not near a priest. Sure. That's sure. the problem. Sure. No, thank you. Just a, thank you. No, thank yeah. you. And thank you for taking those midnight calls. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for your talk. And oh, you're welcome. Uh, my question is, so you, you talked a bit, it sounded like about the Roman Catholic churches. Mm -hmm. um, is there any different uh, notion or feeling that you're seeing in perhaps the Byzantine rite or other rites in the Catholic Church? Yes, um, it's, um, it's a very fertile conversation. And again, it, this, this document is so complex, it's on 20 different topics, but one of them is the Eastern Rite churches and our fellow, our, our, our community, and our sense of ecumenism with some of the other right Catholic churches. And um, again, read Phyllis Sagano's books because she goes through the different, there's three of the Byzantine right churches who have... Could you like spell her? Zagano, okay. Z-A-G-A-N-O. There are three of uh, the Eastern right churches which are Catholic who have women deacons. So... It's complicated. It's very complicated, and and the Orthodox Church is is having a fertile conversation about women in, in the diaconate as well. So, it is in an ecumenical context that these conversations are going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation and also all this time for question and answer and the great questions from our students. So please join us next Sunday as Franciscan Father Edward Foley preaches at the 10 a.m. Mass and then presents on the topic, Preaching in the Sciences, the Neuroscientific Turn at our 6 p.m. dinner. And we also have books for sale. that will be $15 over here if you'd like to use Venmo or cash, both available. So thank you all for joining tonight. Thank you.